Hi ladies, can I get you female women anything to drink? Which of you ovary owners wants to go first? Can I get you born with fat on your chest anything to drink besides water? How are you she hers liking the food? I'm a walking contradiction You don't get my existence Cause it's troubling My identity You're facing this confliction I'm not what you envision When you hear me speak Declare my identity No, I'm just saying that you kind of promised student loan forgiveness and a lot of us voted for you because of that. And the fact that you're kind of backtracking doesn't really make us trust you. You know, I hear you, I, I totally do, but you gotta understand from my perspective, I can't just bypass Congress and hand out billions of dollars to anybody who asks for it. Papa? Would you, excuse me for one second. Hey buddy, what's up? I ran out of money. Buddy, we talked about this. Okay, well, I'll give you an advance on this week's allowance, but this is it for now. Okay, thank you. Kids, man, what am I, a bank account? How much did you just give him? It was like 105 billion, but back to your question, I don't think we have it in the budget. Marceline, is it just you and me in the wreckage of the world? Welcome back to Black History Fast Facts, where every day in February I give you a fact about black history you might not have known. Today's fast fact, Trayvon Martin should have turned 29 today. Born on February 5th, 1995 to parents Sabrina Fulton and Tracy Martin, Trayvon Martin was a young black boy with a deep love for family and a passion for music, football, and aviation. One summer at age 12, he took an aviation course, unlocking his unknown passion for planes. And by 13, he was in aviation school, making accomplishments like learning how to land a plane. However, his brilliant life and all his potential were cut short on February 26, 2012, when he was followed by George Zimmerman for looking suspicious in a predominantly white neighborhood. Despite clear police instruction to not follow, Zimmerman engaged in a fatal altercation with a 17-year-old boy, shooting him in the fight. And... After his trial, the jury shocked the nation by acquitting him of all charges. Despite the devastating loss, Martin's legacy lives on through social movements like BLM that advocates for the thousands of lives lost by police brutality and gun violence. And while he should be spending today laughing, partying, and celebrating another decade filled with the love that he was so used to, we should honor his legacy by continuing to advocate for racial injustice. Happy birthday, Trayvon. And that's your Black History Fast Fact. It's 2024 and people of color still have to walk into buildings where the building is literally a name after a slur. If you are someone who thinks this is wrong, I strongly encourage you to reach out to Secretary Deb Holland. She's the Secretary of Interior and she has gone out of her way to rename places that used a slur against specifically Native women. Right now, her and her advisory committee on reconciliation are taking suggestions about places that should be renamed. This is where you can come in. You can go click the link in my bio and it will take less than a minute and you can fill out this information and send a message to Deb Holland. You can even customize the message if you feel very particular. Be passionate about a specific site that is important for you to see removed. What I love about this action is that it's not just about native places. It is an action from Lakota People's Law Project and Black Lives Matter Greater New York coming together to do good on behalf of people of color. So yeah, it takes a minute. Go do it.
Photos like this shatter my heart. Thought the idea of women being baby making machines was despicable. This girl's never gonna have a mom, but as long as one of her dads is like more feminine, should be fine. I guess moms are just totally replaceable by men. We are live! Once again with America's Favorite Game Show, Google is free! I'm your host, Jed Almanac, and this is the show where our contestants try to use the free search engine Google to make some sort of sense out of the crazy videos that we see on the internet. Today's contestant needs no introduction, so let's just bring him out. Everybody, please welcome Marcus. How you doing, Marcus? Yeah, I'm doing pretty good, Jet. That's good to hear. Marcus, are you ready? Yeah. Yes, I'm ready. Okay, you've got 60 seconds. Let's start the clock. Yeah, I don't need to Google this stuff. I can kind of just tell you. Fuck me, Marcus. That was fast. What did you find? So it sounds like when she says, I thought women weren't baby making machines, she's equating our fight for a woman's right to get an abortion with surrogacy. But what we mean when we say that is that women should have the right to choose when and if they carry a fetus to term. And that's what surrogacy is. This woman is choosing to enter an agreement to carry a child to term for any number of reasons. The woman is choosing to do that, not being forced to carry a child to term like anti abortion laws make them. It also seemed like she had major issues with the fact that some gay couples, like the one in that picture, or are the intended parents of surrogate children. I wonder if she'd have the same issues if it was a straight couple, seeing as the majority of intended parents of surrogate children are straight. Now, Marcus, we can't assume that she hates gay people because she's being blatantly homophobic. Maybe she just missed the mark because she cares so much about the mother's rights. You know, she's probably pro-choice and pro-women's bodily autonomy. No, she is incredibly anti-abortion under any circumstance, even cases of essay and incest. Well, that's fucking crazy. She's so pro-women's rights that she's willing to force hundreds of women to carry their essayers' babies to term. Actually, thousands. What? Thousands. There have been an estimated 65,000 pregnancies caused by SA in states with abortion bans since Roe v. Wade was overturned. Well, she doesn't make any sense at all as a person. Well, she kind of does. How? What? Oh, she's a right-wing Christian. Yeah, buddy. So she doesn't actually care about women at all. Correct. <laughs> she's just homophobic. That's why she made that video. Yeah. Okay, it all makes sense now. Thank you, Marcus. You win. God, you know, these people are like an on-fire fire truck. Horrifying and painfully ironic with all the tools to put an end to the madness if only those tools weren't currently ablaze with God's love. So really, all you can do is sit back and watch the thing slowly char and fall apart under the weight of its own stupidity. Just like that, we are out of time. As always, I'm Chad Almanac with Google is Free, reminding you all that Google is indeed free. I am so excited. Got the coolest box in the mail. It's one of my favorite brands. They're called Catone. And every year for Black History Month, this is the second year, they release a Black Joy collection. These are literally pieces of like fine art. I, I'm not even gonna tell you exactly what it is because I just want you to be surprised by the beauty of each one of these. Mark. I always want to make ASMR videos. Catone, because fat people deserve to see our bodies glorified in art. I. I'm gonna cry probably. Wow. Ugh. It's so beautiful, y'all. Ugh. And these little beautiful purple flowers. These are so beautiful. I can't wait to have these in my home. They smell amazing. Ugh. Oh my god. I think these are top surgery scars. Oh my god. These are literally like top surgery scars on this candle. And it's gold. Ugh, it smells so good too. So beautiful! Okay, there's one last one. I'll wipe my tears. I love queer art so much. It's literally a little mushroom. Shut up! Oh, look at it. Oh, these are so lovely. I love them so much. Definitely follow Catone. Support their Black Joy collection. This is the second year that they've had a Black Joy collection. I'm so happy to have these in my home. Trans-exclusionary rules are designed, they have always been designed, to police all women, to discipline all women. Make us mistrust anyone who looks like they don't belong in the category of women. More specifically, I should have added this before, I'm gonna add it now, in the category of white woman. Is the sex testing that is currently employed by international athletics federations the sorts of tests that disqualify athletes like Castor Semenya, Duty Chan, Christine Maboma, and Beatrice Masalini? Say nothing of Amina Tusseini, Margaret Lambui, and Francine Nionsaba. Somehow just happens to exclude certain women of color. Implicitly, their definition of a normal woman is premised on a norm defined by the bodies of white women. I cannot say this with certainty, but given that it is only Sub-Saharan and South Asian women who ever fail these sex tests, we have plenty of data now showing that different ethnic groups have either higher or lower average levels of testosterone. It seems very possible that some groups of athletes were undersampled when determinations were being made about a typical testosterone range. 
So when Joel Berry accused Joanna Lagona, a cisgender woman, of being trans, her race was also a factor. It's not just that she failed to meet his measure for womanhood, and that would be bad enough, but that she was also failing to meet his mark for white womanhood. His test is also white supremacist. I'll say that louder for the folks at the back because we like intersectionality here. Any test of womanhood, of who or what is a real woman, is always also racist. It's always also tied up with white supremacy. Because we can't just separate discussions of femininity, of the idealized forms of womanhood from discussions of beauty, purity, innocence, whiteness. And those ideas, those values, those ideologies, they creep into everything. I asked my mom why she's against free health care. She's like, well, it would make the waits so long. Would universal health care in the U.S. mean longer wait times to see a doctor? My name is Sarah. I'm a health economist. I'm getting my Ph.D. in economics. And this is the kind of question I was born to answer. Because there is a ton of research looking at how universal coverage systems affect wait times. So let's dive in and you can share this with your mom, your grandma, whoever you need to talk to about this. Quick note here, former President Donald Trump said that Medicare for all would, and I quote, force patients to face massive wait times for treatments and destroy quality access to care. So if you're curious if he would support universal health care, the answer is no. But anyway, what does the economics research say about this question? A study by the Commonwealth Fund compared the United States to 10 separate countries. It asked questions to kind of pick up this question of how does the U.S. compare with other countries in terms of wait times. These are kind of hard to read, but essentially these were surveys done to assess how different countries fared in terms of health care. And one of the metrics they measured is timeliness, this column down here, and they asked a bunch of questions relating to that. Now, over in this very last column, all the way on the right, is the United States. And if we think that we're sacrificing timeliness for universal health care, the United States should have the lowest percentage in these metrics of timeliness. But even if we look here, saw a doctor or nurse in the same next day, last time they needed medical care, the United States is at 51%. But there are countries, Australia, France, where the percentage is higher. If you want to pause to read across all of these metrics, you can see that the United States is kind of in the middle of the pack. What the researchers do here is because a lot of these countries are not the same populations, they would standardized these scores into this performance score. So these are the performance scores for that timeliness measure. I tried to make this as easy as possible, but you might want to take a screenshot and zoom in to pause to read. But as you can see, the United States is doing the worst in most of these metrics once you standardize the results. Even though the U.S. does not have universal coverage, it has some of the worst outcomes when it comes to wait times. The question is, is what actually contributes to longer wait times? Because we have research that shows this. Big caveat here is that we need to acknowledge the fact that wait times are already pretty long in the U.S. There's a study done that actually compared wait times between VA and private hospitals and found that VA hospitals had significantly shorter wait times. Things that primarily contribute to longer wait times include things like hospital concentration. If you're in a smaller city, you might have longer wait times than if you're in a larger metropolitan area. So what insurance you have might contribute to longer wait times. In the U.S., if you have private insurance versus Medicare or Medicaid, also known as public insurance, might change your wait times. But again, that length varies greatly depending on the study. Here, there's this LDI paper that says that wait times are only two days longer than privately insured patients if you have Medicaid, for example. So it's not necessarily the public universal coverage in and of itself, but it's how we make the system specifically in the U.S. when it comes to public coverage that contributes to these longer wait times. When we compare ourselves to countries across the world, we actually don't fare that well. If you have any questions, let me know. Stop with court. That looks so cool, eh? What's this?